leads me to the question I think everyone is waiting for me to ask, which is about the Palestinian boycott, divestment, and sanctions call, which you have both endorsed. And uh, in, on several occasions now, whether it was in Edinburgh, in Melbourne, or right here at SIF, uh, you took strong stands against uh, state institutional support, Israeli state institutional support for these uh, film festivals and pulled out your film on, on many occasions. Uh, before we get to the actual boycott call and endorsing it, how did you come to the issue of Palestine altogether to reach the point of endorsing boycott? Um, well, um, I mean, I, um, I mean, I, I, I was, I guess, like many people, I, aware that there was a situation going on um, when I was younger, um, <coughs> and it, <coughs> so I didn't know the full story until um, I was asked to direct a play in the theatre. Um, and I'll try and keep this story very short, because it could go on. But it was, a play, <coughs> it was a play called Perdition, and it was written by a writer called Jim Allen, who I'd worked with a lot. And it, it told the story of the last uh, months of the war in Hungary, and of how half a million Jews had been taken from Hungary to the camps and exterminated. And it asked the question, how was this possible when Germany was losing the war, when the, a lot of people, half a million people is a lot of people, how did they manage with, with a skeleton of a few people? Because most of the German military were obviously engaged in fighting. How did they manage to get them all on the train? And of course the story is, which I guess many people here will know, that a man called Kastner uh, masterminded an agreement with Eichmann that the train would leave uh, with some chosen people on. Maybe the, the numbers vary. Some people say 1,500, some people say 10,000, but some thousand people say would leave and would go to Palestine. And in return for that, some Zionist leaders, some Zionist leaders, would pass on the instruction to get on the train. Shocking story. Shocking story. Jim wrote a play about this. It was destined to be produced at the Royal Court Theatre. If anyone knows the Royal Court Theatre, it's probably the, the most famous small theatre in London. I mean, it, it's, uh, it is par excellence the writer's theatre. It's where the writer is king. You know, what the writer needs to say should be said. Um, and uh, a week or so before we were due to go on, uh, the director of the theatre gave the script to somebody uh, who was uh, a known Zionist, who was a Holocaust survivor, um, and he read it, and they began a campaign which resulted in articles in all the main papers. Um, extraordinary campaign. Within days, every paper carried like a full-page <coughs> article right in the center of the comment pages, denouncing this. Um, they never managed to, den to find the like, big issues wrong. I mean, you know, they might come and say, well, the number was wrong, or this very small point here. But the, the, the substance of the story was never challenged. Um, but it was criticized, it was, of course, it was anti-Semitic. And um, in the end, it was uh, uh, the theatre uh, back down, and it was banned. And it was uh, <coughs> read later at the end of the festival, we did a reading. Um, and it has been produced since, when the Zionists kept absolutely quiet. They went from total opposition, kill this, and they killed it, to total silence, said nobody would know about it, and there would be no fuss. But the, the <coughs> power of that lobby was just took my breath away. I mean, we've been dealing, as I was told, we've been dealing with right-wing trade unionists, you know, and they can kick up a fuss, and the Labour Party, oh, they can kick up a fuss. But this was something else. This was something else. And from that day on, I said, well, I've got to find out why, what's, what's the issue here? And then, of course, the story comes out, and the story you know far better than I do, I'm sure. Then the story comes out, and then you realize, hey, there's something very wrong here. When a state <coughs> founded on race has such power. And from then on, I mean, my mind was made up for it. Well, I suppose there's been so much coverage of the injustices that have taken place and what's always taken my breath away, I suppose it's just the, the constant um, resolutions passed by the United Nations, the General Assembly, the Security Council, 
And I suppose what's always really amazing is to see um, international law on the one hand interpreted, decisions made, people come to conclusions, they debate them, and then they are absolutely, totally ignored. I mean, that really is quite remarkable. And especially when the United States and you know, Great Britain keep on saying how we must respect the rule of law, how we must expect international law, but it's, um, it's only when it suits them. I mean, and the gap between um, you know, international law and what is on paper and its implementation has become broader and deeper and wider. And little wonder, you know, so much of the world now looks to the West and say, you're just great, big, giant hypocrites. We can't, I mean, it's just so obvious. And, then, and even there, just three days ago, we saw it happening once again. We saw Hillary Clinton you know, with Abbas and Netanyahu, they said, these, this is the time, and these are the leaders. <laughs> who is she to say these are the leaders? <laughs> you know, who's she thinks Superman, she thinks a superwoman, she thinks she's in a Hollywood movie or something like that, you know? But it's like, she totally ignores the entire United Nations, the General Assembly, years and years of resolutions, and then she decides what's going to happen. And the hubris, and the arrogance, and the stupidity is just breathtaking. And then, of course, you know, Gaza is sitting there like the elephant in the room. They're not referred to. They're not even... And what's absolutely terrible as well, I saw the BBC News report just the other day, and they didn't even mention it. You know, and how can they expect peace when they dictate the terms that way? So, I mean, anybody with half a brain and an imagination, um, I suppose is just, you know, just amazed at the, the massive bias and how they set the agenda. In terms of BDS, um, you pulled a Eric movie from Melbourne. Uh, you refused to show up to hype up film festival. Last year, you signed on to the Toronto Declaration. What has all this activity meant to you? Um, well, it, it's um, the important thing is to is to operate in, in the field that we're in to show solidarity <coughs> as best we can with the, the Palestinian people. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, it has to be made very clear, and it always is made very clear. This is not a boycott against individual filmmakers. Um, it is against this the involvement of the state. The same state that is illegally building the wall, the same state that is illegally putting settlers, allowing settlers in, and so on and so on. Um, and that um, it, is, it is, would be abhorrent to us to take part in an event in which the, Palestine, the Israeli state has its fingers. But it's really been funny how this has been reported. Is that, I mean, especially, I think his name was Mr. Moore, as if you were yeah. determined to Rich, censor Rich. Richard Moore. Oh, not Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard Moore, but you know, the tone is that we're trying to censor you know, other filmmakers. And again, it's just twisting the reality so much. This, I mean, it breaks my heart to see a, somebody who's made a film, who's worked on a film, and know how much effort it takes, even to make a bad film. <laughs> <That's a little laughs> <effort. laughs> and I'm leaving myself open to criticism there. But, um, but I mean, we're, we're, we are faced in a situation where a grassroots organisation in the West Bank and in Gaza are saying, we have suffered this, we have no voice, they're ignoring international law, and um, we have debated this with our grassroots organisations, and we were sent lists of all the organisations, and, and I take it and trust that there's been debates and there's a democratic reflection of grassroots opinion. And when they ask us to support them, you have a choice. Do you say no, or do you say, well, or we don't care? So um, we, we obviously <coughs> we, we have to make a decision. You must show what side you're on. Mm -hmm.